Okay. Uh, so binder. Um, what is binder? Yep. So the plan now is in in the next one hour. Let me actually know. Let me see whether I'm already sharing something. No, I'm not. It doesn't matter. We will share in a moment. I don't even know. So what binder is? This will be a tool that we will demonstrate in the next 50, 60 minutes, 50 minutes, 40 minutes, which connects nicely to the dependency management. I think it will also connect nicely to the data visualization lesson. Because the problem that we try to solve now is, so let's, let's imagine that we created a great visualization on Tuesday. So we, we read the data with pandas and we did some statistic analysis. And at the end, we got some nice plots. And now we want to share our plots and our research with the community. And the traditional way of sharing this is to share it in a PDF. But that is actually not the best way, maybe. If you have tried to, if you have tried to copy paste something out of a PDF, or if you try to change something in a PDF, I mean, if you want to rerun it. So this lesson is really how can we do it better? How can we share our research in a better way than just putting it in a PDF? How can we make it reusable? How can how can we make it reproducible and even modifiable? And it should still work in five years. So that's what what it's all about. Yeah. It will yes. be. It will connect nicely to Jupyter notebooks, but it's not only for Jupyter and it's not only for Python. I mean, you can also the tool that we will show. You can also use it for R, R Studio, in principle, actually anything. Right. Yeah. Anything that can be in Docker, mm -hmm. which is anything. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we will share a container. Right. So um, let's see. So Binder is a cloud service, I believe. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Should we open the lesson and have a look and start? Yeah, let's go. You yeah. have it open, I believe? Yes. Or you're opening it? I have it open. I know the font is too small. I just wanted you to just find like where here to find it. So now we will be here in Binder. So I'll open it up and then I will zoom in. Binder. Okay. Zooming and in. Mm -hmm. Did you already say overall what Binder is? It's a web service for running code. Yeah, I think with the Jupyter web, interface. Yeah, it, we we can we can imagine it as as a web service that is that is free, or where I can run uh, Jupyter notebooks in the cloud dynamically mm -hmm. without even having Jupyter installed and without having any of the other dependencies installed. So anybody else can really yeah. revisit all my all my pipeline from from data import to explanation to the figures yeah. and they can be run it. They can even modify it. I guess this is sort of the main point. So maybe the point is that you can do this and then other, anyone else can run your code. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a way of sharing your work in a way that allows people not just to see it but also to use it. Yes, they can interact with it. They can they can go in and say what would happen if I change this factor two to factor three. What how would the plot change? They can just go and do it. Maybe the most common scenario is just to just to rerun it. Mm -hmm. So as an example, there have been well, one of our examples in Code Refinery was that someone makes an article and then they have their code and data in Binder. So someone can start and basically recreate their exact plots and mm -hmm. do what Arvan said. So try adjusting the parameters and see what yeah. is going on. And now the things that Sabri mentioned, requirements of text, environment of YAML, now we will need these things. Because this will this will define uh, this will define the environment, and it will tell a binder which precise environment to recreate for us. Mm. So now now these things will be important. So some just some questions, motivations that we want to clarify. I think the take home that I will try to to pass along is that sharing code 
And in this case, code can be a data visualization Jupyter notebook. That sharing code alone may not be sufficient. Mm -hmm. And we will have a bit of a discussion in a moment why, what problems can appear. Some of it we have already discussed in the dependency management lesson just before. We will show one way of really sharing uh, the computational environment through Binder. There are other ways, but this is, I think, a very nice way for, for Python and Jupyter. And we will demonstrate it. So for one example, I will demonstrate how to do that step by step, but, but the steps are also documented here. So I will really follow this lesson. And so we'll demonstrate this service called Binder. Maybe, depending on how the timing goes, maybe we have time to discuss also how to make this citable. So how to get a digital object identifier for your notebook in us through services like Zenodo, and then you can yeah you, then you can cite it and it's preserved for forever. Okay, should we go? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So this this exercise one here. It was designed for a group work, but I think we shouldn't assume that people are in groups. Although I think watching this in a group, it would be really, really fun. So we can we can take this exercise one as, as a hack and D discussion. So maybe somebody can help me copy pasting this into the hack and D. And and I will I will have a look at this. It would be fun to hear from you. And in the meantime, let me introduce the, the question. So what, what do we want to know here? When, um, here's an example from the, um, I guess it's geoscience community. So you may come across a code that does some Python stuff and, and on top it imports from a package, some, some modules functions. And this may not be enough. It may be difficult to rerun it a few years a few years down the road. And just to give it here like a tangible example. So the example is that Leah is a PhD student in computational biology and spent two years of intensive work. And now the paper is ready to be published. The code she has used for analyzing her data is available on GitHub. GitHub is a service that many people use to share code and Jupyter notebooks, I will also demonstrate it. Uh, but her supervisor, who is an advocate of open science, told her that sharing code alone may not be sufficient. So what, what uh, problems can you anticipate? And I will have a look here. OK. I'm switching to HackMD. Thanks. So we see. Data might be missing, yeah. Code mm -hmm. without documentation. Mm. Code without documentation is great points. And we have also then discussed uh, keeping data and code close to each other if it's possible. Yeah. And we just discussed dependencies. So dependencies, dependencies yeah. have newer versions in two to five years. Yeah. Which always so, happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So somewhere there are somewhere a place where we list all the dependencies that we have. Um we might want to know which versions. Even if I do that, can I still get some problems? Even if I list all, all the Python packages that I need and the versions, can I still get problems? Let me see whether anybody... Have you ever had a case of code that just doesn't run sometime in the future? Like it's made on some processor architecture which doesn't exist anymore or like mm. somehow depends on the basic system C libraries or something. Yeah, those evolve slowly, but they do evolve. So I have seen code that doesn't work, C code that doesn't work, that only depends on the system libraries hmm. because yeah. it's 10 years old. And great, this are, these are great keywords. So system libraries, I also see an, an answer there in HackMD, is that when we import Python packages, they might have something else than Python underneath. An example is Matplotlib. It's not only Python. There is also Fortran, or NetCDF, or these geo libraries, or SciPy. So there might be actually more underneath. And they might depend on 
the libraries that are in your system and they evolve as well. Yeah. And then we might need more. And then one rescue can be a container. A container is like documenting actually the operating system, not only the Python dependencies. And this binder service that we will demo now is one way of running this in the cloud and having it reusable or reproducible. Mm -hmm. But there are other great points here on how can be tests, mm -hmm. operating system. If something was compiled, how was it compiled? Examples. There is processor dependency. It's very complicated, and I think we we shouldn't we shouldn't try to over engineer it either. Like we shouldn't be we shouldn't be afraid of sharing something just because it may not work in twenty years. Mm -hmm. It will probably not work in twenty years, but at least we can try it, that it works for a couple of years. Yeah. And and even if it even if it doesn't work, then at least the documentation can help. Yeah. Because some somebody can then go in and do some archaeology and try to recreate it. Yeah. I guess at least if it's shared, if someone needs it, they can do the work to maintain it themselves. Right. So let's yeah. let's try it out. So maybe I can we can go back into the into my screen share material. Okay. We're here. And we will demonstrate one way of doing it. I so here what we what we will try now, and this is a very nice picture here, is that we we created this Jupyter notebook in step one. We have this notebook in step one. And what I will now do in step, step two, so we will do the step two. We will create a notebook. I will put it on GitHub. And this is not a course about Git and GitHub. So we have other courses and workshops on that. But uh, we will upload the notebook to GitHub. And then from there, we will run it through this binder service and anybody can visit it, anybody can rerun it. So that's the goal. And one example that we can take, you can try it with any other Python code, but the example that I will use is the one of these visualization exercises from Tuesday. So this is, mm. okay. we have seen that before. So I will, step number one, I will take that and I will put it into a Jupyter notebook. On okay. my computer, so I'm still on my computer here. Let me try start it out, and I understand this is tiny. I will make it a bit, a bit larger. First thing I should do, well, let me first copy paste. But before I do anything, we should rename. Let's call it, I don't know, visualization. And I should also try to actually run it. Does it still work? Nice to see what it does, yeah. OK. Yeah, seems to somehow okay. work. Good. So let me save it now. On my computer, I'm still. I saved. So this is notebook is now on my computer, but now I want to share it with the world. Uh, so step number one, I will put it on GitHub. GitHub is just one of the many places one could put it. There is GitLab. Yeah. We will not go into that much. I guess this is the reason why this is a demo, because yeah. we don't want to require it. Exactly. Git. OK. Yeah. It would have been in 15 minutes to explain Git and GitHub create accounts. It would have been a bit too much. But I still encourage you to, to go through this. Yeah. Uh, to this so now I'm on, I'm on GitHub, the place where I can put code and notebooks, I will create a new new repository, new project here, just for this, just as a demo. OK, and let me zoom in. And we give it a name. I don't know, Python course, Python okay. demo 2021, just demonstrating binder. So I create this public. I want this project to be public because I want to share it actually. So in this case, I want to have it public. And I will I will create a readme file there. I will, the other things, I'm not worrying, worrying about it now. So I create this, this project right now. There is not much, there is a readme file in there. Yeah. Okay. And in this project, I will now collect 
Jupyter notebooks, for instance, mm -hmm. the one that I just created. So let me here I can edit. Let oh, nice! See. Using the web interface. That makes yes, it simple. Using the web interface, create okay. new file, upload files. I want to upload. Choose your files. Is the notebook okay, saved? It's saved on my, so now maybe outside of the screen, just because I don't want to share everything that is on my hard drive. <laughs> so somewhere there is there is a folder where I saved the notebook and I selected it. Visualization.ipy and B. I need to document what I did here. So uploading my notebook and I commit, I save this. Okay, uploading, uploading. Um, GitHub and Git is wonderful for so many reasons that we that I will not go into now. Um, it's a different course, it's a different workshop. We have now this notebook on GitHub. And actually, if anybody can visit it now, mm. and actually feel free to, you know, I can paste. I'm, 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 not pay. to I'm pasting it. So anybody can visit this on GitHub. It's already pretty good to share code like that, but it's not perfect. What There are two problems. One problem is you can actually have a look at the notebook. That's great. If you click on it, yeah, it will even, show me. It will show me the notebook. Yeah, it shows you all the content, so yeah, nice. someone mm -hmm. can see the plot, see the stuff. <laughs> I mean, better yeah. than most of the ways we share stuff already. Yeah, I think this is really. This could be very often. This is good enough because anybody can now go and copy paste it out and reuse it. And of course, you can download the notebook and run it on your own computer. Mm -hmm. Good point. You can do that as well. So here on. How would I do that? I can hear down somewhere there. Yeah, I think the three it. dots there and uh, oh, not quite. Is it oh, raw okay. or how do I well, well okay I would, at least that but okay. I would do that and save file, but that's not exactly ideal. Yeah. Well, yes. okay, so somehow. So there are ways. Um what is that's great. Um, one problem is that I can't actually edit this thing. This is this. It's just an image. Mm -hmm. I can go in and modify. It's it's not a dynamic notebook really. Second problem is I could decide to delete this project on GitHub, and if if I do that, well, then my work will not be reproducible in five years. Mm -hmm. So maybe we will solve both problems in this lesson. Now we will take it. Actually, let me have a look on the. Well, maybe you can help me relaying any questions from from MKD. None so far. Yeah. Let's say, carry on. Yeah, no questions is always means that it's maybe too fast, too slow, or completely out of scope. But so I please... think it's good. Just keep going. Okay. All right. <laughs> no. How much time do we have left? Do we have like twenty minutes left, right? Yes. Oh, ten minutes. I can. Twenty. I can... Twenty minutes. Okay. Yeah. So now we will take it one step further. And this is this is this card here. Um, so I will now we remember this what Sabi explained requirements of text. Because this is a file that the binder will understand. So I will add, I will create this file and I will add these dependencies to it. So I want to document that this project depends on pandas with this version. It probably also runs with other versions, but I know for a fact that it, because I created it with, this, with these versions. It also depends on matplotlib. So copy, let's go back to here. And here I will create a file called requires.txt. Add file, create new file. Requirements.txt. Now I cannot make a typo because that would confuse binder. Copy paste. And now I need to write what I did. I'm documenting dependencies. So in the previous lesson, we mentioned that there are many programs that expect the file to have exactly the right name. And this is one of them. Yep. So it is actually looking for requirements.txt by exactly that name. So I saved this thing. The file is now here. 
also that is already useful because somebody who wants to now run the notebook, they could also open a file and have a look and see that it will probably work with these versions. But now we take it a step further and let me just adjust here a little bit the screening. Now we will visit this wonderful, wonderful service called Binder, mybinder.org. I will open it up. This service can turn a Git repository into a collection of interactive notebooks. We will have interactive notebook in the cloud. And the notebook can be in different places. It can be on GitHub, it can be on all these different places. In my case, it's on GitHub. And all I need to do is I need to copy paste the address into here. Okay. So we tell it the name via, yeah, it refers to GitHub, okay. And what it will do, well, it will go in there and it will look for this requirements.txt file. Alternatively, environments.yaml, it understands both. It will create this environment and then I can run whatever is in there in this environment. And I could click on launch and it will just do it. I will not do that. Instead, I will do something else. It suggests that it suggests me to copy paste this into my README file. So I will, let me copy paste it then. Because then anybody can just anybody visiting this repository can now uh, can launch Binder. So into my README file, I add um, I add this thing. And maybe instead of explaining what's happening, we will see the effect of it. Adding our binder badge. Commit, save. And what I got now is this button here. So anybody visiting this, this project on GitHub sees this button. And now we will, I will click on the button and open it up in a new browser tab. And now Binder does some thinking and some working. It now went in there. It looked into my requirements of text. It's now installing an isolated environment here. It actually sets up a Docker container and it, it will install these dependencies into it. And we will wait a couple of seconds and use this time to have an eye on HackMD. And in a couple of seconds, maximum one, two minutes, it will have this notebook running for me. And then all I all I need to do is to share this with people I want. So even I could I could refer to this in my publication. Later, if we have time, we can try to give it a digital object identifier. But this is such a more useful supporting information to a publication than than just an image in a PDF. <laughs> so a very good question while we're waiting on mm -hmm. um, on HackMD. Who is running Binder? Who is Binder? That's a great question. So you know? I think it's some sort of, they got some public funding and a grant to work on this and have been slowly developing their uh, mm -hmm. thing. Some of the resources are donated by different cloud providers and organizations, as you can see on their page. I can also add to this that the binder itself is open source. And you can also run binder yourself. Well, probably you wouldn't do it as a person, but it might be an idea for a community to set up their own binder instance or for university or like a national service. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. And I can't say that the binder people overlap with the Jupyter Hub people. So it's that's basically the same team, and they're using it to fund Jupyter Hub development in part. Yeah. And well, while this is still spinning up, and it's been it takes a bit of time. The first time is is creating this environment because then the environment will be cached. So second time I will visit it. It will not take so much time, but I can use the time to answer the question about programs written in C++ and other languages. So yes, you can run, in fact, any, you can run any Docker image in a binder. Of course, if you use mybinder.org, there is a time limit to it. So there is a resource limitation. And I don't remember how much the resource limitation is. It's normally 
no problem at all to run these notebooks, but for heavy duty calculations, you may hit a limit there, but it doesn't have to be Python. Okay, well, let me see. You can still wait. Let me see what's happening in the lesson, just that I didn't forget anything. Still working on it. So in a, in a moment or two, there will be a notebook, there will actually be a Jupyter lab running on this address. So running on somebody else's computer. And the nice thing about that is, is that somebody who visits this and is patient and can wait a minute or two can run this and all they need is a browser. They don't need Jupyter, they don't need Python, they don't need Matplotlib. All they need is a browser. I think this is really wonderful. Maybe we can let it continue spinning. Aha, here it is. Here it is, Jupyter Lab launching. This looks somehow familiar, but it's not on my computer. It's it's on this address here. And now I can I can go in and open a notebook. And I can do run all the cells. And I can even go in and modify things. So what happens if I change this to then it will become more transparent. So this is now interactive, it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, great. Now, depend on timing on, we could talk about this part here. It's a bit um, depending on the schedule. I would be already, I think I'm already happy what we have achieved. So we, this, this can also be consumed in, in reading. We can, yeah. we can demo that as well if, if we want to. We do have 10 more minutes, so I'd say we're answering the questions pretty well. So let's press ahead and see how far we get. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit, this is another wonderful service, Zenodo, run by CERN and other organizations. It was designed to, to host data from CERN experiments, but these days it's used for, you can, you can make your code and your notebooks and your data citable through the service. It's not the only service. So what I will now demonstrate here in very few minutes is something that is useful, not only for Python, I would say any, any code that we create is to eventually make it citable. Actually, it solves two, two things. We make it citable, but also we preserve it. So even if I go in and I delete my GitHub account or repository, Zenodo will keep a copy that will hopefully never move away. And here are a few steps on how you can achieve that. If you want to practice this, I recommend to do that with the sandbox. So Zenodo has a sandbox. It's like a practice field where I can experiment and I don't have to be afraid of breaking things. And once you know that this is working, then you can go for the real thing. And the reason why I will now go for the sandbox is that this is only an example. It's only an exercise. I don't want, I don't want to preserve this exercise for the next 20 years. <laughs> um, Zenodo makes it difficult to remove things for good reason, because, because that's the point of it. I mean, it, it, uh, all right, so let's, let's practice on the sandbox where we can just experiment and we don't have to be afraid and it can be removed. Good. So when once you visit, this is how it looks. And there are already some articles and maybe codes and data published by other people. I will I will log in here with uh, with my GitHub. You can log in with Orchid or you can create an account. I still verify I'm still on this I'm still on the sandbox. I log in with GitHub. And Zenodo has a very nice in, inter, a very nice interaction with GitHub. Is that now what can I do? I can all we need to do to make to get a digital object identifier and to make to preserve the notebooks 
is to is to activate this repository on GitHub. And now there are many. I just need to find it. What was it called? Python something. Python. So I have too many repositories on GitHub, but somewhere there is Python. Python demo 2021. That's the, that's the one. That's the project we just created. All I need to do is switch this to on. Now Zenodo will, will watch this repository. And whenever I create a release, and release is, it's like a milestone. A release could be, for instance, when I publish something, or release could be at the end of the PhD thesis. So whenever I now create a new release, Zenodo is watching it. And for every new release, it will create a new digital object identifier. So all I need to do here is create a release. And maybe, how should we call it? Uh, 1.0 or, so this is, this is the published version or this is the version, this is the preprint version could also be. And later we can make modifications to it. And now I pub once I publish the release, publish, Is this, has this happened? Publish. We weren't able to release. Uh -huh. mm. Okay, I forgot to do something. So I need to do, I was, it works like this. Create a new tag, okay. It's a detail, not important now. I created this release on GitHub, and now in the meantime, Zenodo is, if I go in here, it it actually already did something. So it created a digital object identifier for me. Now I can share that. People visiting this DOI, they will find a copy of my project. If you actually now, maybe if you now try to go to this DOI, you may not find it, and this is just because I'm on a sandbox, but the mechanism is the same. Mm -hmm. And connecting it back to binder. Now the even better thing would be sort of the gold standard would be I could now go on my binder, my binder.org. And instead of binderizing the GitHub repository, I could actually create it from the Zenodo DOI here. Super. I think this is all, all I wanted to show. I really encourage you to try this out. It will it will probably take more than 15 minutes. Try it out, try, test out also the, the, the Zenodo sandbox. Try out binder. Here are all the steps. There is much more you can do. Uh, there are these citation CFF files. So you can, you can tweak and configure, but this really the, the, just getting it to run was very few steps. Key point, what was, the, what was the point of all of this? We have a mechanism to really share an interactive, reproducible computational environment. I think Binder is not even the only example. I think there are other tools, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's one example for many of these. Yeah. Someone mentioned um, in HackMD, mentioned Google Colab and asked what the difference is. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I mean, Google Colab essentially uses Google Drive to house the notebook. So it's not on GitHub, it's not um, using Git, but otherwise it's just very similar. Yeah. It's, it's, probably, way of doing same thing. it's probably good. Uh, two comments there. Of course, there is a for profit company behind it. This is not the case yeah. in mybinder.org. The other, the other comment is that Google has also terminated projects in the past. So there is always a bit of a question like, will it still exist in 10 years? Will they decide to, that this is maybe not something they want to continue? So in terms of sharing uh, research output, I think maybe Zenodo is the better place, but what can still collaborate on Google Colab, but still good to then put it somewhere where we know this is, this is um, not going away. Yeah. yeah, I would compare Google Colab and Binder, uh, not Zenodo. Mm -hmm. Zenodo mm -hmm. is for keeping something forever. Um, or as long as possible, 
uh, mm -hmm. archiving something. Um, and um, Binder, GitHub also, um, mostly actually GitHub and um, Colab are for collaborating on something in real time mm -hmm. and sharing. Great. I'm checking whether there are any other questions. Okay, well, there is yeah. also um, another question, other tools equivalent to Binder. Um, so I don't know mm. of anything we haven't mentioned, but do you? I don't. I'm sure there must be. CoCalc mm. is something I know of, but I don't know if that's like Binder. Binder is a very specific kind of thing because it wants anyone to be able to do something. And mm. when you don't have accounts, then it's hard to monetize somehow. Mm. Questions about the code changes in the in Binder. So what if I make changes? I can make changes, I can experiment. But but if I later log out or if I forget my tab open, after a while it will stop working and Binder doesn't save anything. I mean it it creates this instance for me and later everything is vaporized. So if I want to save, if I really want to save this, my changes, I need to save them and then so I would save it to my computer. I would commit it to GitHub. So, the, so if you change it on GitHub and restart Binder, you yeah. will see the changes on Binder, but not exactly. the other way around. Right. Mm -hmm. Good questions. So I think we have perfect timing. We could go soon into a break. Yeah, should we do that and come back at... Well, should we make it exactly at the zero zero of the hour? Not go too much ahead. Sounds good. And then after the break, we we will learn about packaging, and then like a wrap up discussion, and then after party, right? Yes. Exactly. Looking forward. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks for listening and. See you after the break. See you soon. Bye.